school. Should we get started over here? More people can creep in as and when they wish. Um, welcome to the Faculty of Music, those of you who don't know us here. It's great to have new visitors and new faces, people I've not met before, so thanks ever so much for coming. Um, my name is Matthew Machen Alton Reeds. I'm the Senior Research Associate and Principal Investigator um, for an ERC funded project, past and present musical encounters across the Strait of Gibraltar. Um, broadly speaking, we're, we're a team of five researchers. We look at collaborative encounters across different communities and cultures of the Western Mediterranean region. And both in colonial and post-colonial contexts, we're interested in how music is a form of intercultural dialogue, cultural diplomacy, but also some of the sort of attentions and that emerge in, in the ways in which music is used and to represent different communities in, in this region. Um, we have lots of events on, such as today. In fact, this week has been packed with events. So I just got back from an event that I was running in Spain. Vanessa has been running an event in, um, in London, the Yala Conference of SOAS. We've had Andrea Azole. Um, we've had a reading group today, conference yesterday, elementary students today. It's been a fantastic, um, fantastic week. Um, so do please follow us on our website. We have some flyers here. Um, so feel free to take one when you leave. Um, we're on social media, Twitter, Facebook, so on and so forth. So follow us, um, see what events we have on, and we'd be delighted to see you at anything we are running in the future. Um, I'd like to remind you that the talk is being filmed today, so I hope that's okay for everybody. There will be a discussion at the end. There'll be 15, 20 minutes um, for questions. Um, so if you prefer your voice not to be recorded on camera, then maybe hold back. Um, but otherwise, I hope you're comfortable with, with the, um, the presentation being filmed. Um, so I'm delighted to be able to introduce um, Professor Edwin Sarusi for our guest lecture today. Um, so Professor Sarusi is the Emmanuel Alexandra Professor of Musicology and Director of the Jewish Music Research Centre at Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Um, born in Montevideo in um, Uruguay, he immigrated to Israel in 1971 and where he undertook undergraduate and graduate degrees in musicology at Hebrew University before completing his PhD at UCLA in 1987. He's taught at Bar Ilan and Tel Aviv universities in Israel and has been a visiting professor at various universities across Europe and North and South America. And in 2018, he was awarded the prestigious Israel Prize for his significant contributions um, to the field of Jewish music and Jewish studies in general. Um, Professor Sarusi has published widely on North African and Eastern Mediterranean Jewish music, on Judeo-Islamic relations in music, and on Israeli popular music. His book publications and other publications include Spanish-Portuguese synagogue music in 19th century reform sources from Hamburg, and the co-authored Popular Music and National Culture in Israel. Um, his talk today is entitled Liturgy, an Overlooked Corner of the Moroccan J Jewish Musical Map. So please join me in welcoming Thank you, Matthew, so much. Uh, good afternoon. I'm extremely uh, glad and honored to be at University of Cambridge today after so many years. I cannot count how many. And uh, be here in the company of uh, colleagues and some students of the past and uh, some honorable guests too. Thank you for coming. Uh, I will be succinct. I, I, I have an opening statement and then we will hear music, which is what I like to do. And uh, the lecture is a little bit modular, so I will monitor my time and when I see that the time is over, I rather uh, have a dialogue with you and speak about what I'm talking today or any other subject that you think it's um, uh, related to the uh, ERC project that Matthew has been awarded. And I told Matthew before um, this lecture a few minutes ago uh, that how close I feel to this project uh, in various capacities uh, and uh, it's uh, no uh, coincidence and it's very natural that I will be uh, speaking to you here today and I'm very glad to do so and I was thinking also that this is a great opportunity to go back to some of my materials of 30 years ago we are still waiting for some processing and analysis 
uh, simply uh, just I cannot cope with uh, um, so much rich information that we have gathered over the years. So I will play you particularly uh, one major recording that I did um, exactly would be almost 40 years ago, 81. Yeah, I was then young and energetic and did this thing. So, um, so the main question is uh, t today, I mean, what triggered me is if uh, research interests mirror contemporary political and social concerns. And you know that it does. And this is a legitimate question that I would like to delve into by addressing the way music of Moroccan Jews is addressed. As Moroccans, Jews in Morocco shared with their Muslim fellow compatriots diverse repertoires at various registers of musical production. These repertoires include not only the major expressions of what is called high culture, in the case of Morocco, al ala also known as Andalusian music, that have acquired, uh, as uh, will be stressed here, a predominant present in entertainment and also in academic stages. But this Judeo-Muslim uh, musical encounter in Morocco also encompasses lighter urban genres, most prominently Manjon, popular shabby songs in their traditional and modern forms, and in the inner and southern lands of Morocco, even Jews uh, uh, share genres with uh, the Amazigh people, like we have uh, Jewish Ahwash, and so on. This sharing of musical repertoires encompass male and, to a certain degree, also female genres as well. Moreover, as modern Moroccans, Jews of Morocco were also open to other styles of Arabic music that entered the local scene in the 20th century, such as Algerian popular music and certainly Egyptian, particularly Egyptian, Ugania, the big song tradition of, uh, of Egypt in the mid 20th century. In addition to the chanson, both the chanson franco-arab and also the plain French chanson and so on and so forth. It is well known that Jewish musicians were at times, especially after the establishment of the French protectorate uh, and the accelerated urbanization of Jewish population in Morocco at the forefront in the promotion of some of these genres. Put differently, the Jews were not a minority of passive recipients of the music of a majority, but agents of musical production and distribution, at times supplying the music on behalf of the Muslim majority. This shared musical space in both its pre-modern and modern permutations is the one that has been hailed by public interests as well as by the scholarly community, and I include myself in this community. Research and performance of Moroccan Jewish uh, religious music, on the other hand, has been largely dominated by the singing of paraliturgical Hebrew uh, poetry, especially the repertoire of the early morning vigils called Bakashot. The allure of this repertoire is clear, for it is largely related to the historically prestigious Moroccan, Arabic, and Illusion music. In other words, paraliturgical singing is emblematic of the deep Jewish musical embedment in Moroccan society, and is thus easy to manipulate as an icon of late day convivency. This shared music is projected from the present into the past as a heir to the days of the old Judeo Islamic and Christian living together in medieval Al Andalus. Yet, the bulk of Jewish religious worship, namely, daily, weekly, and holiday prayers opens an alternative and fascinating research arena that has hardly been harvested. Unlike the paraliturgical piutin, these religious repertoires mark sonic difference between Jews and Muslims. It is an intimate space of Jewish sound that links the Moroccan Jews not so much to its immediate neighbors, but rather to the diasporic Jewish commonwealth of Sephardic and Oriental pedigree, and to a certain measure to modern colonial sources, mostly French Jewish. Remember that synagogues in Morocco were traditionally very small physical spaces, 
sometimes serving only an extended family. These very reduced spaces enhanced, it, enhanced this sense of sonic intimacy. Yet, this intimate musical space of the Moroccan Jews still bears some traces of the non-Jewish surrounding, as we shall hear. It is not deprived of what they call Andalusianisms at different levels, some at the level of voice production only, of technique, others much deeper, that are, in my opinion, of more modern, a more modern phenomenon. There are, of course, aesthetic and, est and ethical reasons too, for the lack of emphasis on the liturgical repertoires of the Moroccan Jews among the agents of musical production and music scholars. This music is highly functional. It is generated by structures and contents of sacred texts whose clear cut and ceremonial performance and pronunciation precedes musical concerns. These texts are an assortment of diverse origin, biblical passages, post-biblical prayers, they are in prose and they are in poetic patterns. There is a notable relationship in Judaism between, Juda between prayer and learning. For this reason also, patterns of learning with melody have permeated into the liturgy. So this is my opening statement. And with that, we will move into presentation that is a little bit It's okay. So that's our title. Uh, I want to just mention uh, very briefly that I am not the first scholar who is deeply interested in the liturgy of Moroccan Jews. We have a very important publication, very disregarded by scholarship. And this is volume five of Abraham C. Edelson's multi-volume uh, Oriental, uh, orientalische Melodien Satz, that's what the HOM says, which in English is called the Thesaurus of Oriental Jewish Melodies, Oriental Hebrew Melodies, I'm sorry. And uh, Ilson collected uh, uh, the entire liturgy of the Moroccan Jews in musical notations, mostly from two informants uh, from um, that were living in Jerusalem in the first decade of the 20th century. Uh, one of them from Isawira, <laughs> who moved to Jerusalem. And uh, I think it's my uh, hypothesis that he uh, met two cantors from Gibraltar here in London when he was a visiting lecturer at the Jews College in 1922, and he took from them particularly biblical cantillations. So, and the, the volume was published in 1924 5 uh, in a Hebrew edition and later on in an English edition. Uh, and uh, they were published when Edelson was already professor of Jewish liturgy at the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, I wrote uh, an extensive study, and I can send you the, the article. It appears in the first sheet for Professor Ron Stillman. Uh, and it's dedicated to this forgotten volume, which I found extremely uh, important. So, we move into our first example. I will play you examples from the soundscape of the Jewish internal intimate life in the synagogue. And I decided actually to start with an example that is uh, not so much uh, liturgy proper, but it's uh, a text, uh, the ethics of the father, or in some other translations, the saints of the father. This is one of the tractates of the Mishnah, of the Jewish oral law. And traditionally, this text is performed in the synagogue since six consecutive Sabbaths, starting from, from um, um, Passover until Shavuot, for, from um, in Christian terms, from Easter to Pentecost. Uh, and uh, um, it's usually performed in the morning after the prayers, people stay in the synagogue. And it's a way of reenacting this book. It's a book of morals. It's a book of saints of the rabbis that teach you ways of life. Many of these saints are very famous beyond the, the 
world of Hebrew literature in translation because they are humanistic general um, uh, suggestions as how to behave in a human fashion. And this is the very beginning, so it starts with the pedigree of uh, the, the ethics of the fathers, and we start with Moses, with the Torah giving in Sinai, etc. So I will play you how this is performed in Morocco. Uh, the person, and I always mention uh, the people who are performing, I think it's very important. This is uh, Rabbi uh, David Kadosh, he lives now in uh, Toronto. He's an amazing uh, teacher of uh, Moroccan Jewish music in Toronto. He has a website in YouTube, and he has a channel in YouTube, and you can follow him. I talk to him. He's an amazing uh, resource of knowledge. And this is the way uh, it sounds. <laughs> So, you can see that this type of music is what uh, very old musicologists call cool sax, called logogenic. It's a music that structure derives from the structure of the text. It's not a composition that you can sit and enjoy, but it's a very practical tool to, in a way, enhance the structure of the text, that is the division of the text into paragraphs, and also to uh, uh, create a, a certain type of uh, syntax that is also musical. So usually the, you have a sentence he would say. So there is an opening and then you say, and this rabbi he would say, and then you have the saying and the ending. And each one of these sections contains a musical motif that is unique to it. So immediately this melody can help you to make very precise sense of the structure of the text, but also it's a great mnemotechnic device. That is, you can easily memorize and rem remember this type of text by singing it than by reading it. So this is a very ancient uh, tradition, and the Moroccan tradition is very unique in the sense that it's very syllabic. The Eastern traditions of the Ottoman Empire are much more melismatic and enhanced. They are even based on Macan. And here we have a very simple uh, to But if you heard the final cadence, the little melisma, the very short melisma that he has, you really can hear a tiny bit. That's what I say when the sound of the outside of the synagogue enters into the inner part of the synagogue. But more interesting is the reading of the Torah among Moroccan Jews. You know that uh, the Torah, the five books of Moses, are read in a yearly cycle in the synagogue, Sabbath morning, every Sabbath, one portion. And the cantillation is done, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, following a system of symbols or signs that direct re the reader as to the proper performance of it. So let's hear. Uh, this is from Parashat Bo, Exodus uh, 10. Uh, and uh, I, I want to say also that some of this information that I am getting now 
uh, regarding Moroccan liturgy comes from an amazing, I know you will laugh, but don't laugh at me, an amazing WhatsApp list of the Moroccan cantors in Israel. And they post the most amazing pieces of information that it will take me months and years to find out. So every day I open and every day there are about 50 messages. This is totally insane. Sometimes I just erase and I don't read them because otherwise I would be all day reading these messages. So this uh, reading came from Parashat Po. It was three, four weeks ago. And it was so beautiful and so clear that I decided to play it for you. scrolls that are deposited in the synagogue and the scrolls have no vowels and no symbols. So the cantor has to remember all this by heart. But actually the system helps him to remember the way of reading because again the music, so to speak, derives totally from the syntactic uh, uh, and uh, even in this, uh, in this case also the accentuations of each and every word. The accent falls on the accented syllable of each word. So you know that from the rhythmic point of view, the stress tone will come always on the stress syllable. And then you have a musical phrase that equals more or less uh, a verse of the Bible. So you have a unit. The unit is divided in subunits. Each verse has two halves, and each half is musically represented by a middle cadence, by an ending cadence. So, this is uh, very complex, what I'm telling you now in three minutes uh, needs a long time to understand. But what I'm trying to say here is, once again, this is a type of uh, music or musical tradition that is very much embedded into the Moroccan Jewish psyche, but has no value, so to speak, outside its performance during the synagogue service. and. Uh, and still, you see again the outside coming inside. Several of these um, uh, accents, uh, the biblical accent of us, we call them Masoretic accents, uh, are extremely melismatic. And these two or three accents that have a very extreme melismatic certainly reminds you of the way of ornamentation in Moroccan, whether Malhun or Andalusian music particularly uh, the mode Hijaz al-Kbir, okay? Okay, that's Hijaz, and that's how parts of the Torah are read. So if a Moroccan Muslim comes and hears, they say, what, what the hell he's doing, musically speaking, but I know he belongs to my, my, my area, okay? So that's uh, uh, what we can learn from from um, from the biblical calculation. Now, the, 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 we also have very ancient texts that form part of the liturgy. And uh, one of them, and I will have to go out from the presentation because the recording doesn't like the <laughs> PowerPoint. Uh, uh, it's uh, uh, the uh, Seder Avodah. The Seder Avodah is uh, performed uh, in um, uh, Yom Kippurim. Uh, in the Day of Atonement, that uh, it uh, literally describes the uh, order of the sacrifices of the, and the entrance into the Holy of Holies 
of the, of the uh, high priest. So uh, it's a, an extremely uh, uh, deep moment in the Jewish liturgy, and it has an opening, and this is the opening, and I will play you uh, a recording that came in this WhatsApp list uh, a few weeks uh, ago by Rabbi David Buzadeh. It's a recording that they didn't know that it existed, that the rabbi uh, allowed to record, certainly not in Yom Kippur. You, you can hear that someone is interviewing him at home and says, well, now start, okay? So, and they pull the, uh, okay. I think what's in the early 60s recorded in Casablanca. formula, again, we have, you see that these three first examples are a fixed formula that is, how should I say, elastic. So you have different lengths of text in the different phrases, and the music adapts itself to expand or to be shortened by this uh, very simple and, I assume, quite ancient melodic uh, uh, formula. Now, Rabbi Buzaglo was the greatest, one of the greatest, I don't know, Great. They were other great, but one of the greatest performers and teachers of Piyutim, of Andalusian, the, the, the Hebrew version of Andalusian music. And therefore, he has the, the, the manners, okay, even when he does this very simple uh, melodic pattern, he has this manieristic of a paitan, of a person who is used to sing Piyutim. But he never departs from the formula, and it shows that he was also a great cantor, regular cantor, and not only a performer uh, on the stage. So uh, that's um, for uh, this uh, um, example, and we will move on now. Um, second. Yeah. So this is my recording from 1981. It was done in Tiberias, in the city of Tiberias, in northern Israel, on the Sea of Galilee. And it was done uh, in the framework of my research for my MA thesis at the time. And uh, it's uh, um, a group of uh, uh, singers and cantors, a very interesting uh, group in Tiberia with a great um, uh, consciousness for continuity. So what was amazing, and I recorded it, what you're going to hear is a regular daily evening service. It's something that usually takes between 12, 12 to 15 minutes. It's a very short service. And in my honor, they brought all their children who they teach. So there are many children in this service. It's very touching. When I heard, and I forgot about this recording, I said, oh my gosh, this is such an incredible recording. So I will play along a few pieces to show you how the Jewish liturgy work. Until now, we heard uh, examples that are uh, uh, selected from more from the learning side of, of, of the continuum, and now we move into the regular liturgy. 
Now, the Jewish liturgy it has an order. There is a book. The book has, as I said, different texts. There is one text that we will hear uh, at least a couple of times that uh, it's, uh, it functions as a marker between different sections of the text. And this text is the Kaddish. I will play you uh, very soon a Kaddish and you will be able to hear. So what we have is a series of texts that are divided into different sections. Every section uh, has a different uh, textual uh, origin and a different function. The central part actually of every Jewish prayer is a silent prayer. So there is no sound uh, here. Uh, but, uh, and, and I was very proud that I recorded this, the silence too, which, which I erase it now, but because the silence is never silent. There is always some rumor, some sounds, and that has to do with the performance and sometimes with uh, some social uh, networking in between the synagogue. But I won't go into that right now. So the prayer opens with a very small uh, passage. It's a mystical passage about the power of, of, uh, of prayer. And this is a, a very uh, um, characteristic of only the Moroccan Jewry. So, uh, very few other Sephardic communities do this piece. It's said at the beginning. And uh, uh, what is important uh, to note here that this is one of the aspects in which Moroccan liturgy uh, shows its, uh, the deep uh, um, uh, embedment of Kabbalah, of Jewish mysticism, in, in the prayer. What I'm trying to say is that although all the Jews pray more or less the same prayers, they don't pray exactly the same prayers. And there are different versions of the, of the, of the book, of the prayer book. And the Moroccan prayer book is very unique in many senses that it has very specific texts that are nowhere to be found. Some of them show actually the antiquity of this liturgical uh, tradition. So this is the way it sounds at the beginning, and you will be surprised, but I will say a few words after we hear it. <laughs> funny noise is that uh, we went into the synagogue is in a shelter, in a, a public shelter that is used as a synagogue. And uh, I was rushing from another recording and I was trying to find the best place for the microphone. This was recorded with a Nagra, which is the best recording machine ever until this very day. No, no digital stuff, real tape that has to be changed every half an hour or so. But, and, and you get amazing uh, results. So I left this uh, noise of the microphone. It stops at the, at the continuation once the, I found the right place to put it. So you heard that the beginning is not something that we will conceptualize as music. It's like a sort of incantation. It's said by the cantor very quickly, very rapidly. And there are many sections of the Jewish liturgy that are performed in this way is on the, on the uh, continuum from non-music to music. This is towards the non-music. And this is one of my points in my research on Jewish liturgy in general, that all what was not considered by uh, Western uh, conceptions as something being musical was never treated in research. 
And for me, the service go from zero to 100, and within this continuum, all what is noise, and you will hear a little bit of noise, all what there is, the most characteristic sound of the Jewish liturgy in all the Jewish communities is what I call the cloud. So the cloud is not where you put your data, but it's a cloud of sound that has to do with the fact that every person is praying at a different time, in a different pitch, in a different tempo. And what you get is something like uh, you will get from a contemporary piece of music uh, by, uh, uh, you know, by a contemporary composer. Now, the, the prayer moves from this incantation into the first psalm. It opens with a psalm. And this singing of psalms by the entire congregation is a staple of the Moroccan Jewry. There are very few other Jewish congregations that have this technique of singing the psalm in the, in, with the entire congregation as a choir. And uh, it's uh, an amazing uh, practice uh, particularly to see how many people can do a music that has not a fixed meter singing together. And the issue, the, how it is done, is done very simple. There are three musical values. This is music theory a little bit, but you have a short value, value. you have one which is double the short and one which is four times the short. So what you have is a punctuation of the text that goes stressing with the longer, uh, with the, the two beat uh, sound, the stress syllable, and the one beat sound, the unstressed syllable. And the four uh, beat uh, sound is the one that ends the verse. So the sounds have verses, and the recitation goes ta ti ra ta ti ta ta ti ta ti ra ta ti ta ti ra ra pa ri ra ri la ra ri ra ra ta ti ra ta ti ta ti ta ta ti ra ra so I'm just improvising so you have half phrase end of phrase and again the phrase can be expanded or contracted as many in accordance to the number of syllables that you have so it's like an accordion okay. But how the whole congregation sings together is amazing. The, how it's like there is a conductor. However, one of the most characteristic uh, features of, the, of this Moroccan style of singing psalms is that there is also polyphony. And this type of polyphony relates to some types of polyphony in Andalusian music that enter into the singing of psalms. The division of voices, okay? It's not a, it's not a uh, pattern that, that repeats, but it occurs, and it, all of a sudden it opens into a, a polyphonic um, uh, texture, and then it closes back into unison uh, uh, again. So let's hear again, now that you know the explanations, it goes very fast. <laughs> شيتي كيم يا عقوة بالمشتبك كدي شبي دقيم شبي كون عزم عمر يزن عزم عمر بهين وعلين وما سيخون وما سيخون بيه We have a recitation term, okay? We have a recitation term, okay? Half Okay. This was a long verse. I won't go into the theory, but there are certain long, very long uh, verses that give an additional motif. I can give an entire class on this. It's a uh, it's fascinating uh, technique and how, uh, how it works. Uh, if you go in, uh, to Kabbalah Shabbat, to the um, uh, welcoming of the Sabbath in the synagogue, so Kabbalah Shabbat opens with uh, seven psalms of this uh, type. So it's a big uh, choral uh, singing. And in many uh, Moroccan synagogues, they also sing the song of Shira uh, Shirin, um, uh, the Song of Songs. 
um, sometimes they sing with soloists, but sometimes they sing the entire community also, which is in, with another technique of salmoni. So the participation of the public in Moroccan liturgy is one of the highest in the Jewish world. It's one of the most communitary type of liturgies. Uh, there is a cantor, and there are very renowned cantors, but certainly the role of the cantor is not as central as it is, let's say, in the Ottoman Jewish traditions, in the Eastern Jewish traditions, etc. Moreover, what is also important to know with the Moroccan liturgy is that it is the most fixed liturgy, musically speaking. That is to say that it's re the, the music is repeated in every holiday, every Sabbath, almost the same. There aren't many musical diversions like you may have in the uh, Eastern uh, practice, that you have a different makam every Shabbat, or in the Ashkenazi practice that you have uh, certain modalities Except for different Hanabi. parts. What? Except the Hanabi, the Shabbat, they have they have, they, have, they have a fixed makam and they yeah. change makam. Yeah. But the Moroccans never change. There is no makam okay, in Morocco. By the way, one of the interesting things with the WhatsApp uh, community is to see how the Eastern makam is influencing now the Moroccan cantors. Because they, say, they, they write inside, tell me, Ramel Maya is equivalent to, to Ajah, and this is equivalent to him. So they are trying now to find this makamic uh, way of speaking about the music that is not makamic. And when I tell them there is really no makam in Morocco, the concept of music is different, OK? It, it's confusing when you use the term makam, but that doesn't convince anybody anymore. That's what I was talking in my lecture in London about the cultural imperialism of the Halevi, Yerushalmi, um, uh, Hazel. So now we, we get into the uh, uh, Kaddish. And uh, you have here the text of the Kaddish. Let's listen. Uh, the, so the, the, the uh, service uh, s starts with the psalms. And when the psalm finishes, there is Kaddish. And then the prayer itself starts. So uh, this is the beginning of the evening prayer. And I marked in, in uh, in red, something that is also unique to the Moroccan liturgy. Even when the cantor is reciting the prayers, there are responses by the congregation that are not written in the, in the, in the book. The congregation knows this is a very old tradition of community participation, you will hear. However, I, I was with my wife in Ashdod three weeks ago as a guest of the city of Ashdod, which is today the capital of Andalusian music, second to Esawira, if I may say. And they had an entire Shabbat, and I saw there is a new Moroccan prayer book that says where the public has to enter. So that means that they don't trust the oral tradition anymore. It has to be written to be maintained. OK? So I've never seen that. of the same recording. My friends, I, I, I really, when I was preparing for this, I was frustrated that I cannot play you. The whole service is about 19 minutes. 
but, but to speak about each section will take an entire seminar. So if you invite me back to, to Cambridge, I can do that. However, um, I just want to cover a few other aspects and then we'll go into the, the, the questions. But you see that all what I'm telling you now, it's not written anywhere. There is no article. I mean, Vanessa, you know, uh, that speaks about this common practice of Moroccan Jewish liturgy because it is not uh, part of the music that one would hear on the stage or in a festival or in a performance or in a, uh, even in a recording, even though there are recordings of the cantors that they distribute between themselves, how to do that. So I want to go into just what I call musicalization. This is another uh, term that I entered into, into Jewish music research. My belief is in general, okay, I'm speaking now about very generalizations, that the Jewish liturgy was never a musical event. It's an event that is, first of all, you have to pray. Uh, you don't need any music to pray. You can just go by the text and that's it. Then, if there is some musical aspects, you have mostly this relationship between learning <coughs> patterns, patterns of study and patterns of prayer. And the fact is that in, in older Jewish communities, the synagogue and the Beit Midrash, the school and the synagogue were the same space. So people were studying and then, oh, it's time for pray. They go into pray and they go back to study. So the relationship between praying and studying is extremely uh, close. Therefore, uh, when, when music in itself enters the synagogue, it enters with the addition of poetical uh, uh, additions, that is, the pute. When the, the poetry starts to enter the synagogue, it starts to bring with itself the music. And then this musicalization spreads into other parts of the, of the text until in, uh, in modern times, if you go uh, to, to uh, a modern Ashkenazi uh, synagogue today, the whole liturgy is a sing-along from the beginning to the end, okay? There is almost no parts that are recited in this fast tempo as you heard the Moroccan cantor uh, here, okay? So uh, this is uh, the process that I call musicalization. And let's hear again Rabbi Buzaglo singing one of the, what, in my opinion, the oldest pieces of um, a real musical melody, uh, and this is the Kedusha, the, the very important uh, part of the Jewish liturgy. That's the part that has Kadosh, 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 Holy, Holy, Holy. So, uh, okay, so it's uh, Sanctus, 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 okay, in, in, in Christian liturgy. And uh, we do have uh, here a melody that is very traditional. Before coming to Cambridge, I called Rabbi Luke, I called all the older cantors of Israel to see, do you remember this from your childhood? And he said, oh, I was born into this melody, okay? So it seems to go back uh, quite a long uh, time. Um, so uh, we will hear this, just one second. This is the sanctification for the High Holidays, okay? I play this 
for the historical value that this recording has of the voice of a person who arguably was always maintained, he never allowed anybody to record him. So the more we have the network of cantors, I can see how much he was recorded. Uh, he was blind. The story goes that he always knew there is a tape in the room, even if he was blind. But obviously, he missed some uh, people. Now, people are starting to bring out these recordings. Sometimes they kept in the family, and now they are out. And we can hear his voice. This is exactly, I heard this many, many times in Moroccan civil works in Israel, note by note. As he sings, it sings, it's sung today. And it's a musical piece for the Kedusha. Nobody knows where it comes from. It has no parallel in the Moroccan uh, musical culture. It's a unique piece of the Jewish liturgy. However, uh, we can go into our next and perhaps final piece, which uh, um, is the uh, Song of the Sea or Song of Moses. This is part of the morning prayers, uh, or all the morning prayers. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't write here, but this is chapter 15 of Exodus. Chapter 15 of Exodus is part of the early part of the services that includes the Psalms. So it includes the Psalms and includes the Song of the Sea, the song that the Hebrews sang uh, when they passed the, the, the Sea of Reeds, you know, not the Red Sea, as people say, the Sea of Reeds, uh, while leaving Egypt. Now, the Moroccan Jews uh, have uh, a way of singing this uh, chapter that is um, um, shared by most of the Mediterranean Jewish communities. Here you see the commonwealth of Jewish communities. In my opinion, this is a rather ancient uh, melody, traditional melody. It's not biblical cantillation, even though it, this is a chapter from the Bible. It is not sung according to cantillation, but it's sung to according to this melody, which again is squeezed or expanded, pending on the length of the verses. So here is the uh, uh, traditional uh, uh, version uh, by an old cantor, uh, the father of a friend of mine that passed away many, many, many years ago. So this might be a recording even from the 1960s. This is the opening of the song according to the biblical historical research. The, we have a notation of this melody from 1857 in musical notation. And guess where it was written down? It was written down in the great city of London, Great Britain, by cantor David Aron de Sola, who was the cantor of the Portuguese community in London, David Smart. And uh, already then, in 1840s, he was worried that this modernization is going to uh, cause the uh, oblivion of Jewish liturgy. And they have to write it down. He also wanted this to have with keyboard accompaniment. So we have the melody. And uh, it illustrates the pedigree of it, this melody. And what he writes in the introduction, very important text that is hardly known, I wrote about this regretfully in a foreign language called Hebrew, and nobody reads it. 
but, uh, but this introduction is in English, in old, uh, Victori uh, early Victorian English, okay? And he says, this is the melody that Moses sang when he came out of the sea and the people of Egypt. Okay. And, uh, and now, okay, you can't believe him or not. However, if it is, yeah, but it shows that they, already then, by the mid 19th century, there was this old memory that this is very old memory. And in Morocco, it is sung very similar to what you hear in Istanbul. Of course, the main difference here, and I want to go back to my introductory remark, is the way people pronounce Hebrew and the way people sing. So Mr. Beaton sings like a Moroccan. And if you heard a Turkish cantor singing the same melody, you will hear a totally different uh, impression. Mm -hmm. However, since this is a song and it invites singing, the Moroccan cantors, uh, I don't know when it started, but it's relatively, at least, not earlier than the second half of the 20th century, they start to undilutionate the sound of the sea. And this is the way I recorded with my students in Jerusalem, in Kiryat Yobel Synagogue of Rabbi Chaim Beaton, one of the most important uh, uh, cantors, Moroccan cantors today in Israel. He's not a star like Rabbi Chaim Luke. Rabbi Beaton is just a teacher and a cantor in the synagogue. He doesn't want to perform in public. He doesn't appear, but he's great. And Manny Cohen, who is a great performer now uh, uh, of Pew Team, and uh, he's a disciple of Rabbi Beaton, so they were, uh, and, and it was in the regular service. <laughs> Keep on running, keep on running. 
can become a concert. So this is what they call the musicalization. Usually they will perform the song of the sea like this on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath. Uh, when people have time. In the middle of the week nobody will sing like this because they have to rush, you have to go to work, you don't have time for this uh, uh, let me say this pleasure of, of music. And uh, so I, I I thought I would finish because I said something about colonial flavors in the liturgy. So certainly also the fact that the French protector had brought with it a lot of um, uh, musical education and patterns uh, of French jewelry that also entered in the Moroccan synagogue. I just will play you a very uh, legendary example of Rabbi David Buzaglo, and I won't tell you where the melody now is, but uh, you know this example. Scotland all the way to <laughs> Rabbi David Buzano singing Igdal Igdal is an anthem that ends the services and therefore is a location for musicalization what I call it. it's a place that you can put any melody you want you can change it from one Sabbath to the other nobody's going to complain usually when people are singing this song they are already putting their coats and rushing to eat at home everybody's hungry so they go even sometimes singing outside the synagogue so uh, this is why it's a place of certain laxity in terms of music. And uh, what, I, what I read is that Olmon signed in the French version was very much a sign in the youth movements, in the Boy Scouts of France. They have a French version that they signed. Probably, perhaps, this is how the melody came into, into the Jewish repertoire. Another possibility is uh, this. Um, uh, this Melody they appears in several films, so that it was told in film music, and you would be surprised that sometimes film music is sort of personal. That's another way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that now we have to write it because uh, yeah. it's a pity that. It, yeah. Do we have any questions? Um, I'm uh, particularly interested in the fact that you brought up the sort of. Yeah, I would stand. I, I never <laughs> see that. <laughs> like um, democratic, in a way, nature of the public services. And yeah, you mentioned that in Morocco, especially, it is like especially. And I wondered, what, um, possibly, if you could slightly expand on how it might uh, differ from, you know, further along like, our inter Middle East and Iraq as well, and what the services in the world would count to other. You understand that that's quite a huge yeah, I <laughs> uh, to answer, and I don't want to go into other generalizations. I think that, first of all, it's obvious that. Um, uh, listen, we have, and this is the topic of this research group, this pro physical proximity between Spain and Morocco. And uh, an important uh, uh, thing to know, I'm sure that you stress, that politically speaking, 
uh, <clears throat> at least north of Morocco and Spain were in, in the medieval period, they were like a union, they were like the same country. Mm -hmm. People used to go back and forth. So I think that some of the autochthonous Moroccan traditions are the closest remnants that we can have as to what, how the liturgy was performed uh, <coughs> in uh, Spain, particularly the chanting of the Psalms that eventually spread to the Middle East. What happened in the, uh, again, uh, this is something also that I spoke in London about the geopolitical context of every single community, uh, Jewish community in the Arab world, and how the geopolitical uh, changes and the geopolitical uh, circumstances uh, have, have shaped the musical culture of every uh, area in a, in a different uh, uh, manner. So in the Ottoman Empire, what you have, for example, is that several Jewish musicians had quite early an access to, again, uh, sort of art music of the courts and of the elites. And that music permeated into the synagogue. And that music already required cantors to have certain proficiency in music theory. Okay? And therefore, that proficiency was already translated into a sophistication of the liturgy that little by little marginalized the public. Uh, so the public becomes a little bit more uh, passive and, and listeners. Okay? The same happened in Europe in the 19th century, you know, in, in the big cities of Europe, where the cantors became also like opera stars. And, and you have a choir. So you go to synagogue, and it's like going to a concert. Okay, You have a performance, and the public, the only thing was left for them to say is amen. Okay? And, uh, and, and it, it, there are two communities in which, and I want to give credit to another community that has, in my opinion, even more participation of the public, and that's the Yemenite community. With big chunks of the liturgy are performed by the entire congregation. Uh, some, and they have this amazing uh, organ in, in the Yemenite synagogue where people sing in four different voices. Every age group has a, uh, and they're in four some fields. So it sounds like medieval organ from the church in the medieval period. So, so here you see Morocco and Yemen, and this is not the only coincidence, like two peripheries of the center of the Arab world, okay? that remain, in a way, a little bit more communal in their performance and, and less oriented towards the artistic uh, development of the, of the Jewish community. I hope this is a very short, uh, but the, the issue is uh, very uh, complicated. Yeah. I have a question about the Psalms, because I'm, I'm really, it's like, this is like a project that I have. One day I really want to sing those yeah. Psalms with the family. But, um, but I, I want to know what's happening in Israel with the teaching of the chanting of the Psalms. Do they teach the... the no, they do don't they, teach, uh, but... Uh, like, can you take, can, I know people in Morocco that can read the book with the signs on it, and then no, no, they, yeah, yeah, so yeah. do they do The, the, the system of singing, uh, first of all, there is a book that speaks about this, not necessarily so much about the Moroccan tradition, but you know, Reinhard Flender is a book published by us called Hebrew Psalmody, and it treats the technique, which is again spread from Morocco through the Middle East, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in the Ottoman Empire, in Iraq. Iraq. Yeah. yeah. So what you have is, and this is what is interesting, that only few of the Termin have a musical expression. And the few, uh, uh, Reinhardt explains there that there, there is in the Te'amim, in the accents of the Psalms, uh, two or three of them that have special uh, stopping power. And they get musicalization. While the others have no, it's just a recitation. So you have a combination between areas of, of uh, biblical cantillation, Te'amim, in my opinion, a very old tradition of somebody that kept in memory those symbols that really make a special stop. For example, when you have a verse in sound that has three uh, sections, not two, because 90-something percent of the verses have two, but there are those who have three. When you have three, you have a special symbol that tells you that you made a cadence on, on two-thirds 
And then the cadence for the final verse goes into, in, for the final, uh, uh, the ending of the melody, goes into the first half of the coming verse. Mm -hmm. So this is that confusing that you hear the cadence in the next verse, and what happened here. But that's a very old tradition, and what is amazing, you hear a Turkish cantor, a Moroccan cantor, an Iraqi cantor, they all do the same. The melody is different, but they all do the same. So this is uh, what, uh, what is at stake now. Listen, when you, if you are a child and you go with your parents to synagogue, particularly Kabbalah Shabbat, you know, after the three, four weeks, you know this by heart. Because, you know, it works like that. There is much more teaching in Israel actually of the uh, complicated musical parts of the liturgy. That was my last example, which I have to cut because it's too long, of cantor Edri in the Shdol, teaching the cantors how to perform a melody for Rosh Hashanah that he says nobody does that correctly, you know, and it comes from another pute and you have to know how the text is divided in the other pute and how to apply it to the Kaddish, where you have to go up, to go down. It's an entire session that appeared in this WhatsApp list and I would, you know, uh, I cannot go to all the classes of all the cantors throughout Israel, you know, and, and would just spend all my life doing that. So, but the, this, these classes are sometimes transmitted and I can hear how he explains the performance practice. So the sounds goes like this. Nobody really needs to, to teach that. I, I made transcriptions uh, which are mostly given in my classes at the Hebrew University. I teach the students to transcribe, your care vote, etc. And, and they learn. And I, I have to confess, never published uh, this. But, you know, uh, you can ask. My wife teaches has a look to a Hanukkah and she teaches the sounds reading of the Moroccan Jews because she learned in my class. So not, I mean, not the whole thing. Yeah. 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 In America, you know, in a hundred years, yeah. they will go to America and see some Moroccan <laughs> sound. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do it in Cambridge. Yeah, okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, beautiful. And by the way, there are different uh, Samoan formats, okay? So, and, and you know, I divide them between the cadential patterns. So you have uh, one one, you have two one, and then you later on how it goes. But you have somebody ta da 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 the one in America, according to the recordings that I've heard and what I Maybe, yeah. maybe. Uh, what I think is that there are several patterns and the issue is to which sound they apply which pattern. Mm -hmm. That's what I will check. Yeah. Okay? So you have you have uh, minus two one, you have one one, you have two one, you have four one, and you have five one. Mm -hmm. So the, all these formulas, how they are uh, applied, frankly, I never check thoroughly. There is a system of, uh, you know, <coughs> In, in Shabbat is usually minus two one. This one is Shabbat. This one. The one that you have to do is this one. The one that you have to do is this one. The one that you have to do is this one. The one that you have to do is this one. The one that you have to do is this one. The one that you have to do is this one. The one that you have to do is this one. The one that you have to do is this one. The one that you have to do is this one. Uh, oh, it will be very short. I just want to insist that to emphasize the role played by the rabbis to train the Muslim singers. It was fascinating in the 19th century. Those who were I mean, highly trained in the Andalusian music, <laughs> so traveling all around Morocco, called to teach the not only the Muslim singers, but the Muazid, the, the Imams. Yeah. And by now, I, 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 I want to insist on the fact, to the fact that one of the most popular by today Muslim singers was trained by the rabbi. Yeah. Yeah. And it was yeah. such a capillarity between the mosque and the synagogue. I mean, walking in the summer, and I experienced that myself, when you hear from Mm -hmm. Something. You cannot say if it is in a synagogue 
or in the mosque. Yeah. And it was fascinating. Fascinating, yeah. Well, thank you very much for this fascinating talk. A lot of things to think about. Uh, but I would, I'd like to talk about one thing that I find fascinating, um, and perhaps there's a reason for that. He said that uh, the liturgy itself is not a musical event, and the PU, the power of the song, added this element. And it makes sense to me in many, many aspects. One of them is, I look back for my book, I look back uh, 300 years back in, in all the rabbinic classes in Iraq or, or about and I was looking if there's any rabbi who made any uh, instructions of actually regu regularizing uh, the singing of the piyush. I didn't find any. Uh, uh, and in contrast to the liturgy that you have in Chorke and yeah. which are very strict, when, how, with whom, and etc. So what I'm thinking is that we had the liturgy that was um, codified and was regulated in the 16th century by Carlo, and was very strict relatively. And then you have the piyut that was all over the place with endless uh, kind of melodies yeah. that were, wherever you like, you can put there. So perhaps Kao himself saw that there is a problem. <laughs> and he... Uh, yeah, it's, yeah that's an interesting thought. I, I you know, I, I always read uh, Shukhan and uh, thinking about the dialectics between legislation and social media. That it was written doesn't mean that it was strictly done. Like that. Yeah, or that everybody that. knew how to do like that. But you're right. I mean, there are laws of engagement between one with the logical text. And what we do have... I'm sorry, I'm going to the wrong thing. Possibly not. Um, do you have this written Uh, the, the, what we have in the East is the earliest, uh, uh, let say, testimonies of this invasion of the beauty into, into the liturgy. Uh, we have these manuscripts that um, uh, are from the I gave that lectures this week, so I don't remember what they said in which one. But, you know, the, the canto from the Levantine community in, uh, in Venice in the mid-18th uh, century, that in the, at the end of the manuscript, no, 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 I will give you, I wrote about this a little bit, I'll give you the reference. They, um, they, uh, he wrote, you know, in tiny little letters in the index, it says, Raubadim, uh, which is a section that is musicalized, also in Morocco. Raubadim, lachan of this tune. And then Smechim Betzetan, lachan of this tune. And in, and, and, in the title, he wrote Makam Rast, or Makam Salah. That is to say that he already had a program, a musical program, Makam Bates, to perform the liturgy, particularly in holidays, with a certain Makam, and then certain parts of the text, of the liturgical text, got the melody of a pewd in that book. And that's the earliest, uh, this is in my article, it's called the Machamization of the Jewish Liturgy. No less than the, the Machamization of the Jewish Liturgy. And I, I, I explained all this, how the Macham in the Orient invaded the, the liturgical space. So we have some indications, again, uh, the, this finding data for answering these questions is like finding, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but you know, it's uh, it's an indication of the process that was going uh, was going on. And what is interesting is that all the parts that he uh, says that are musicalized are exactly like it's done today by the Chalabim and the Yerushalmi. Shabbat. So the same parts that they sing today were already sung 300 years ago. We don't know the melodies, we don't know how they sounded, okay? That's what they call 
music-less musical information, but it still gives us uh, quite a substantial. And of course, everything goes back as you wrote and as I, I wrote uh, back to the practice of Rabbi Zanajan. He was really the first one to codify the Makams in the Jewish liturgy, and I think that this practice goes back to him. Except that from him we don't have this and I think from table him of comments. Yeah, yeah, probably, probably, probably. Uh, we don't know what was no, no. I think we have to vacate. Okay, Unfortunately, we only have this room to so there is another um, event which we are. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.